Gears of War, a series that started off really strong, flexing its oversized Unreal Engine muscle back in 2006. I remember it because I played the first Gears when it released on PC, and it was an impressive, furious, adrenaline pumping hell of a ride. Marcus Phoenix and his testosterone filled buddies made a deep impact on the gaming market back in the day. The game offered a very well designed cover shooter mechanics, great graphics and a vivid multiplayer. I would say that Gears of War franchise became sort of a system seller for Xbox. Maybe not to the level of Halo, but it undeniably was important for the life cycle of Microsoft's console. After third Gears of War, Epic Games sold the series rights to Microsoft. Gears 4 and 5 were made by the studio created specifically for this franchise, The Coalition Studio. The newer releases received a little bit of a mixed reaction from the community. Before starting Gears 5, I only played the first game, so I do not have that much experience with this franchise, yet I feel that Gears lost a lot of its popularity and star power in gaming world. I still remember that back in time people were getting extremely hyped about the release of new Gears of War game, while right now it's just another AAA title. I also feel like YouTube coverage for this game is quite mild compared to its rich history and influence it once brought into the gaming landscape. So I decided to voice my opinion about it. This is the late review Gears 5. This review is based on 118 hours of playtime, finishing the game as well as its DLC Hive Busters solo on inconceivable difficulty, and then finishing the base game and Hive Busters campaigns on split screen cop with my wife on experience difficulty. I have also replayed some acts and chapters on easier difficulties in order to grab some achievements. Speaking of achievements, right now I accumulated 126 out of 181 in-game trophies, which stands for 69% of achievement completion on Steam. This is not the final number. I intend to grind a little bit more. I will explain it in the achievement section of this video. I have also spent countless hours in multiplayer modes. I have leveled up 8 classes to at least level 15 in Horde and Escape, I played a lot of casual versus mode, and I tried a little bit of competitive multiplayer. Speaking of multiplayer, I also re-upped 8 times. And I will repeat myself here because it's important. This is a review from a person that has only played and finished the first years of War game. I haven't got much experience with the series in general, although I did some research. So, with all that said, let's grind some Swarm Bones. I like to start my reviews with plot summary and discussion. Introducing the characters and main narrative arc lets me navigate through other aspects of the game easier. But before I'll do that for Gears 5, I just want to quickly discuss the series and the story of previous parts. You see, I'm not an ignorant when it comes to games. I tend to do my homework when approaching a title that got a rich history, which I might have missed. I have read a little bit about plot summaries of previous events in the series, I know what happened in the first game because I played it, I watch on YouTube cutscenes and main story moments from Gears 2 and especially from the third game. So I know about Dom's sacrifice and traumatic events preceding it. I know how it's a staple in the franchise that in each game a Carmine family member dies, and how in Gears of War 3 developers played with this idea and teased players with Clayton and his near-death experiences. I have some sort of background knowledge when it comes to the lore. In Gears 5 the Coalition prepared two cinematic montages that are quickly recapping previous events so new players won't feel lost in the story. It's a good idea, albeit those cinematics are very brief and don't do justice to source material. Ok, I said what I wanted to say, let's talk about Gears 5 plot. This installment continues the story of JD, Dell and Kate. JD is son of Marcus Phoenix who was the protagonist in first three games. He has some big shoes to fill, not only in terms of his legacy, but also as one of the main characters in Gears 5. 
Now, I said that JD is one of the main characters, right? We start our adventure controlling him and he is somewhat important, but the actual protagonist of this story is Kate Diaz. From the moment we will get to play as Kate, the plot will revolve around her own family legacy and the mysterious necklace she received from her mother. Young Diaz girl is going to search for answers about her heritage. She is compelled to put an end to weird hallucinations and awful dreams that keep haunting her. In the same time, a newfound activity within the swarm will start to threaten humanity again. And I think that it's enough of a premise for a compelling story. In general, I think that the plot is decent. Not groundbreaking, not bad. The writing is competent for a big budget title. The story takes a detour from big scale war and destruction in the middle part of the game in order to explore Kate's storyline. In the same time, the lore of the series will be fleshed out even more because of the secrets that Kate will uncover. I like it because a lot of time we see those big budget games or even movies that do not push the overall narrative of the series forward in any meaningful way. You can agree or disagree with the direction the writers took with the story, but you can see that at least they have a clear goal for the plot. Gears 4 started a new narrative arc. Gears 5 continues and develops it even more, preparing the ground for the next title and it feels like there is cohesion, consistency between those games. This is very important for the franchise. A good example here would be Kevin Feige in MCU, a director that oversees all the releases in order to make sure that they stand true to overarching plot. A bad example of that could be the new Star Wars trilogy, where directors fought with each other between movies to keep their vision of the story. Another example would be Assassin's Creed, where the modern day storyline after Desmond's death was convoluted and meaningless. New releases did not push the plot in any new grounds, and it was clear that the writers were clueless. At least until Origins. I still haven't played Odyssey and Valhalla, so maybe they finally salvaged it. Uh, that was probably an unnecessary rant. Let's get back on track. Nightmares. Does it get better? It gets tolerable. So, the story is crafted quite well. The detour we will take into the frozen wildlands might feel refreshing, especially to the people that grew up with the series. It's tight corridors, destroyed burning cities, and dense, chaotic atmosphere of war. The new open landscapes offer a new perspective. But just as the ice can crack under our feet, there are cracks showing in the writing. First of all, it took me some time to get acquainted with the characters. The cast may feel a little bit generic at the start, but with time when they open up about their motivations and some of the skeletons hidden in their closets are unveiled, I started to care more. Still there are some baffling choices when it comes to how the characters behave. Let's start with my biggest problem, Faz. As a character, Faz is so badly written that it's almost criminal. In first act, this guy that clearly has a problem with everyone around him does not let any occasion slide to let everybody know how much of a douche he is. Every single occasion. It's just lazy writing to forcefully make a character so unlikable and to do it in a, such a blatant way. Then later in the game, writers try to sell the idea of his change of heart. I am going to describe this whole ordeal in spoiler section of this video so I can freely describe every detail. Another problem, albeit much smaller one, can be noticed with the tone of the whole game. This series always took itself seriously. The first game did not put that much emphasis on plot. It was mainly buff dudes doing their job, looking spectacular and presenting awesome gameplay mechanics. Of course, it dealt with some heavy themes, such as death, but it's the second and third game when they really put a lot of effort into showing atrocities of war. The gruesome, horrible death of Benjamin Carmine. The whole storyline of Dom and his wife. This franchise knew how to invoke a strong emotional reaction. A lot of time it was depressing. Gears 5 also deals with a lot of heavy themes. It has its share of tragic events, but I do not feel that they hit as hard as the previous events did. Also there are those Marvel-esque one-liners during combat sections that are supposed to be funny. I found them to be mainly juvenile and out of place. If the series takes itself seriously, then the last place to crack some jokes is during combat where every bullet shot by the enemy can end your life. 
Don't get me wrong, I do think that there is a place for jokes and some small talk to lighten up the mood in this game. I just don't think that it should happen during dangerous moments. Block! Block! No, two blocks! Why do you think I said it twice? Oh shit! Reject! Point out of the car door! Spread out! Give it multiple targets! There was some criticism among the player base in regards to the new, younger cast of characters. I have seen a lot of comments claiming that we exchange hard and tough war veterans for spoiled teenagers with daddy and mommy issues. I do not agree with that statement fully. Let's start with JD. James Dominic Phoenix is a son of two renowned Locust war veterans, Anya Stroud and Marcus Phoenix. As I said before, he has a big shoes to fill. A young man like him might feel like there are big expectations in terms of who he will become in the future. And in my opinion, it's totally understandable. The Coalition choose to lead the new Gear story with the cast of characters in the age of something between their 20s and 30s. That's the age at which young people usually start to make a living of their own. They rise from their adolescence into adulthood. JD shows some great leadership potential. He is able to make hard decisions and he is not pristine. He makes mistakes. During Gears 5 he grows as a character, learns from his errors and faults. Then there is Kate, our main protagonist in the campaign. I have seen some claims that she is whiny. Well, I respectfully disagree. Kate in this game just experienced a traumatic event. She was forced to kill her own mother in order to stop the swarm corruption. Now she's experiencing weird hallucinations, lack of sleep, nightmares. It's a no-brainer that person with those kind of problems would want to explore the source of it. Especially when those occurrences are getting stronger. This is the battle that Kate starts in order to regain the control over her own life and in the meantime it will push the whole lore of the Gears franchise forward. I am okay with that writing choice. As a character, Kate is unapologetic, strong, capable to fight. She is determined to achieve the goals that she set for herself. Her voice actress, Laura Bailey, did an outstanding job. If you played a lot of games, there is a good chance that you heard Laura before. She sells the emotions really well. Helplessness, determination, anger. Those are the emotions that Kate will be dealing with and I have to say that with time I grew to appreciate her as a new protagonist. You can help us end this. <laughs> Lady, what the fuck do you think I've been doing? Del is our main companion during adventures. He's very knowledgeable. As a guy that follows the player, Del is used for all those small talks in order to flesh out both him and Kate as believable characters. He also engages in some banter with Faz and JD. This creates bonds inside the team and I appreciate it. When it's done in between combat sections or during travels. Some of the old guard are returning. Baird is something of a scientist himself right now. Well, that's probably the most testosterone filled scientist I ever saw. But I'm okay with it and I liked his contribution to the plot. And of course there is old guy Phoenix himself. I appreciate how Marcus is this badass wise grandpa now. A guide throughout our adventures. So to sum it up, the coalition made the choice to push the plot of the series forward with a new generation of heroes. Of course they could choose to stay with Marcus, Baird, Cole and the old guard but they didn't. So given that now we are focusing on Kate, Dell and JD, there are going to be new challenges. The overall narrative is a little bit lighter in terms of its tone, which for me is okay. Maybe if I was a die-hard Gears of War fan, I would have a different opinion about the direction this series is heading. After playing Gears 5, I really think that the story is crafted competently, although with minor flaws. One of the patches released for the game, developers added an option to change Marcus' look and voice actor to Dave Batista. It can be unlocked in a new game plus mode. It's an interesting choice but in my opinion it is more of a marketing stunt than any meaningful addition. Dave makes an ok impression as a voice actor for Marcus but his model and animations feel unfinished. Ok, this will be a quick spoiler section. 
I mainly want to talk about Faz and one particular story moment close to the end of the game. If you haven't played Gears 5 and do not want to spoil it for yourself, there are timestamps in the description under this video, so just skip this section. How about we make this interesting? You and me spar right now. And how exactly From the first seconds we meet Faz, writers try very hard to make us hate this guy. He chip shots JD, chip shots deactivated DB. Then during mission it's not getting better. The tipping point for me happened during a cutscene where Dell clearly grief stands hundreds of killed civilians. Innocent people they were tasked to save. Fast seeing that takes a jab at Dell. So Dell, see any friendly faces you recognize? Maybe that's the uh, peaceful protester who broke my nose. You deserve worse than a broken nose. Why don't you show me what I deserve? Stop! Damn, enough of this shit! You're a goddamn coward! A coward! This is awful. Who in the right state of mind would say such a thing? To ridicule brutally murdered, innocent, unarmed people? This is so low, so bad. This is something only a sick psychopath could say. In their desperate tries to make fast unlikable, writers unlock the new law. An achievement in bad writing. And for what? To then try to make Faz likable again in third and fourth act? Oh, Is the band back together then? Should I take a picture for your scrapbooks? God, you're an asshole. Oh, stop falling in love. Is Faz's unlikability used only to make player doubt JD's intentions in act 2 when it's uncovered that he's buddy with Faz all of the sudden? I never doubted his pure intentions. Someone might ask, didn't you listen to his previous dialogue? He holds a grudge against those civilians because they threw incendiary grenades at him during riots. Yes, it is explained that under JD's command Faz opened fire upon rioters that attacked him. He is still mad about it and blames them. And I can understand that. You know that under pressure and actual threat to their own lives, soldiers can make bad decisions. And I can believe that some of those soldiers might even try to justify their actions. But to make a mockery out of genocide? It's a step too far. And you know, Fast shows some good soldier instincts, even in the first mission he's in, pushing Dell away so he won't be crushed by falling helicopter. Then, close to the end of the game, if Dell dies, he's shown to care. But it's hard to take this character seriously after how bad his introduction is done. God damn it. The second spoiler I want to discuss is of course the death of either JD or Dell. I'm guessing that developers wanted to delve a little bit into your decisions matter territory. I'm going to say it right away. I think it's unnecessary in this franchise. In my initial playthrough I saved JD. Firstly, because I was still getting kinda accustomed to the characters, it actually did not affect me that much. It was still a shocker to see Dell die, but it was a mild shock. And it was instantly undermined by one thought. What are they going to do next with this thing? Because potentially it could be JD that dies there. Are they gonna go the route of new Wolfenstein games where there are two separate timelines? Or are they gonna make one choice canon? In that case, why would you even create a choice? While giving some agency to the player should be welcomed, I really don't think that in this case it's warranted. Time will tell if my reaction is correct and I will be happy to be wrong. Maybe somehow they will salvage this event in some meaningful way, but I doubt it. Ok, spoilers off. Let's talk about the determining factor of whether you will enjoy the game or not. The gameplay loop. When it comes to Gears 5, the loop remains unchanged from the formula we grew to appreciate in the past. This is as much of an advantage as it is a disadvantage. Let me elaborate. Gears 5 is a third person perspective cover shooter. It means that the game places a heavy focus on hiding behind covers. I always thought that the decision to give players those big buff hardcore dudes to play then force them to hide behind cover was funny. Anyways, in order to differentiate itself from other games, Gears of War series offers a lot of intensive, gory, brutal takedowns. Headshots make our enemies heads explode. There is this characteristic lancer, a weapon with a chainsaw instead of a bayonet that lets you viciously cut swarm drones in half. By the way it was used in Ready Player One, I'm curious how many people noticed it. If you liked the gameplay before, you are probably gonna like it here. 
the developers clearly use the principle of if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And it works to some extent. The basics are there. Throughout the years, the coalition had enough time to reach mastery in implementing those cover shooter mechanics. But the things that in 2006 were revolutionary in the genre now are so basic that the series begs for some kind of reinvention. Gears got some rust in it. I understand that trying to reinvent the series is a very risky undertaking. There is a possibility of alienating the existing player base. That's where evolving the existing ideas comes into play. For example, the series lost a lot of its interactive destructibility of environments. That's definitely a direction that could be explored. Let's imagine a lot of destructible obstacles, columns or bridges that can be collapsed. It would add so much to the replayability in both single player and multiplayer. Destructible walls and obstacles that remove cover, and on the other side collapsible parts of environment that can create a new sources of cover. Maybe sometimes obstruct a shortcut to some key positions. There is a lot you can do with this idea. And I know that I'm being an armchair developer in here. Creating this kind of game space requires a lot of planning, coding and what's important, time investment. But I believe it might be worth the investment. Nice. There is another idea I am just going to toss in there. I played the co-op campaign with my wife. She never played this kind of shooter. Before, she played Witcher series, Newton Raiders and Assassin's Creed Black Flag. So it's safe to say that she was used to different kind of movement in games. When I showed her tutorial section of the game, she felt very restricted by the movement options. So maybe exploring some way to increase players' freedom of movement a little bit might be an interesting solution. I'll just add in here that the current system is so well crafted that she learned it really fast. While we are at the movement, there is one potential problem here. This will be something that will bother newcomers. The button that's responsible for taking cover makes our character glue towards or hide behind obstacles. When there are none, it's a sprint jump button. During firefights or sprinting sections, it might happen that your character will glue themselves into the wall instead. Players that are not used to this kind of movement system might need some time to learn and it might seem chaotic at start, but with time they will get it. Another thing, if we are staying at some distance from the wall but game recognizes that we can get glued to it, this weird animation of our character sliding into the wall will play out. My wife didn't like it. In her eyes it seemed really artificial. To be honest, she's right. I didn't notice it that much because I still remember it being very similar with the first Gears of War game. Now even if it looks weird, it's kinda essential when it comes to advanced movement techniques in multiplayer matches. Players use those slides and sometimes let them play out and sometimes they cancel the animation in order to change direction and get glued to opposite walls. If you would take this mechanic out of the game right now, you risk alienating the most hardcore player base. That's an interesting problem because the animation does look very outdated. Firefights require weapons. Gears 5 weaponry is good. The game offers various kinds of weapons which actually handle differently and feel distinct from each other. I actually forgot that the game had this active reload system. When a player hits reload, there is this white bar with a marker and a slider going from left to right. If you hit reload button again at the right time, it comes as a perfect reload. It's an almost instant reload and increases weapon damage. In some cases those perfect reloads also increase firing speed of a weapon. So there is a great advantage in getting it right. If you will press reload button at the wrong time, your weapon will get jammed. And it will take more time to unjam and be usable again. I love this mechanic. First of all, it rewards skill. It requires players to pay attention. And the enhancement given by the skillful reload is so satisfying. In the campaign, players will be able to find some rare relic weapons. Those are a unique version of existing firearms. They offer some kind of twist. My favorite is a relic retro lancer that shoots exploding bullets. That thing is so powerful. Relic weapons give some incentive to maybe try to take a detour during the campaign and search your surroundings. Gears 5 offers an impressive enemy variety. Different types of adversaries use a different combat tactics. AI is decent, but it's predictable because most enemy types have their one or two given patterns and strategies of engagement. Still, the difficulty of fights comes mostly from the mix of enemies and the terrain we fight on. 
pouncers jump around trying to get a good shooting position so they can freely unleash their load upon player. One pouncer is not a problem, but when you fight against a couple of them trying to control their movement becomes a problem. Add to that a few swarm drones and suddenly the enemies that are not dangerous alone, when mixed together, create a force to be reckoned with. The game offers various difficulty settings, with inconceivable difficulty being the pinnacle of single player challenge, and master difficulty being the hardest on horde and escape multiplayer maps. I finished both base game and Hivebusters DLC solo on Inconceivable. It's definitely doable. You just have to be careful with shooting from behind cover. If you stick out your head for a second too long, it will explode. We have got basic mechanics and systems out of the way, so let's talk about campaign from gameplay perspective. Story-wise it's okay. There are different zones to explore, so the terrain diversity is there. When I started talking about gameplay I told you that if you will like the gameplay loop, you will like the game. And I already told you that the coalition chose to go with the proven mechanics in this title. Did they try to add anything new into the campaign? Well, yes they did. Although I do not think that those changes are as important as other people would say. You see, Gears 5 kinda chases some trends, adding a small RPG skill system in its campaign, it also adds some wide open world zones. I think that open world zones are an unnecessary addition into the game. I mean, it's fine and they offer a breath of fresh air, a nice calm segment in between more condensed combat sections. But outside of the visuals and the small break from the actual gameplay loop, they do not offer anything of value. You can say that they offer player choice in exploration and choosing which side missions or location players might want to explore. But I still think that with more linear zones we would not lose that much actually. So let's say that I'm kinda neutral about this feature. I can appreciate it, but I do not think that it actually adds much into the game. The driving mechanics for skiff are fine. It can get a little bit clunky if you will drive it head first into some rock formations. Getting out of it is time consuming. Most of the modern games have to have some kind of leveling system. Even a tiny one. Gears 5 introduces Jack into the game. A robot companion that can be controlled by other player or AI. Jack is a support character. His main job is not to deal as much damage as it is to aid our character. Jack can be used in some story moments. It can unlock some doors for example. Jack has two kinds of abilities. The aimed abilities that share cooldown and the let's call it overall abilities that have their own shared cooldown. So Jack can blind enemies, set up electric traps, he can revive fallen companions, scan the surroundings, or even mind control some of the enemies. Those abilities are powerful, and playing with the cooldowns becomes invaluable on harder difficulties. Player can find components during their adventures. Components are resources used to upgrade Jack abilities. Here we have the small RPG level up system. This is the addition that I actually liked more than the open world zones. Gears 5 inserts some stealth sections into the game. The zones with rejects, which are the swarm controlled robots, are executed quite well. Rejects are in this kind of sleep state, so they only activate when someone is close in front of them, or when there is too much noise. This way characters can freely roam the area. As long as they won't come too close to the enemies, it's fine. The situation does not work that well with sneaking up to swarm enemies. There are only a handful of those sections in the game, but still. You have no indication of being spotted until they just start shooting at you. You have to lower your suspension on disbelief because in so many cases I just assassinated an enemy in plain view yet none of his colleagues seem to notice. I think that in the campaign the coalition focused on the wrong stuff. I would prefer more work given to overall gameplay systems. I have given the examples before. If developers would build upon moment to moment gameplay mechanics that are common to both multiplayer crowd and single player enthusiasts, it would enrich the experience much more than some campaign sections happening a handful of times. Don't get me wrong, it's a nice addition but the game begs for some influential change or evolution of existing patterns. Five left. I have also noticed a lack of stakes in more scripted elements of single player story. Let's take this track right as an example. Our heroes escape the swarm, riding inside the cargo area of the truck driven by Faz. Everything around is ruined, chaotic, there are a lot of swarm forces. 
and I realized that this is a theme park ride. I'm almost 100% sure that you do not need to shoot a single ball at you. The enemies won't hurt you. So if they do not pose a threat, then why waste bullets? All of a sudden the situation loses its weight. There is also a boss fight where the boss is slowly advancing towards the player. But while it seems like these advancements are the danger, it turns out that only his attacks are posing a threat, and his position in reference to players is scripted. There is only one moment in the campaign that I can think of where time actually pressures the players to make haste. Here is an afterthought. When writing the script for this video I realized that in the first game we had some deviations from regular moment to moment gameplay loop that were supposed to break the monotony. So in the first Gears of War we had this Krill light puzzle where one of the players would light the way for the other one. We had this let's call it tank section, one player shooting, other one driving. In Gears 5 we have skiff and stealth sections. Did you notice something? In the first game the tasks given to players made them do different things from each other. They were forced to work as a team where in this game one player can pretty much do everything on their own. It's a missed potential, especially in the game that is supposed to be played in co-op. Multiplayer in this game is a piece of its own. To smoothly segue from the single player campaign into multiplayer, let's talk about co-op first. Cooperative play is a staple in this franchise. Gears 5 lets you play through its campaigns, both the base game and DLC, not only via internet connection, but also by using split screen. The split screen feature is awesome. There is some magic in sitting next to your co-player and slaying hundreds of swarm drones. In my case, my co-partner was my wife. At first she wasn't so keen on playing Gears, but after we started and she got accustomed to controls, she got hooked. So the next few days when I got back home from work or when we were spending some quality time together, it was her who asked first, hey, are we going to play Gears? She really liked this game. I think that I should admit though that we had some fights over Gears 5. You can play co-op in various modes as long as you are using Xbox. I'm not sure about the Game Pass but on Steam, which is the version that I was playing, co-op is restricted only to campaign, which is a shame. Proper multiplayer experience starts with a lot of various versus modes. always a big part of this franchise, at least back in time it definitely was. There are so many cool modes, starting from standard capture the flag, team deathmatch, free for all, to some more imaginative modes like arcade bleeds, where you upgrade your loadout with kills you are able to score. If you are stressed of playing against human opponents, you can also team up with other people against AI in those modes. Versus mode is where players will practice and hone their skills. Competitive versus mode is where those skills will be tested. Chaotic 2v2 gnashers where you charge the enemy, jump in between covers trying to desperately get that one shot kill before your opponent does. Or team deathmatch where depending on player skill level you can observe that they might start fighting for positions, trying to cover more ground to capture a rare weapon spawn points. It's really cool and it is different from casual versus mode. I was curious about ranking playing Gears 5 because this game came out in 2019 and we have 2022 right now. The game is not that popular anymore, so are there any players to play against? And is their number sufficient for a viable ranked play where you should be paired up with people with similar skills to yours? Well, there are enough people to be able to reliably find matches, but sometimes the wait time might get long. If you are going to play competitive playlists, queue up in the evenings or during the weekends. Then you will be able to get matches in a matter of minute or a little bit more. The quality also will be better. I got some matches where there were people that completely outskilled everyone else, so matchmaking is not perfect. After covering versus modes, let's get to escape and horde modes. Both of those modes use a class based system, where you pick a skin for your character and then pick a class. Each class is different and offers a different ultimate ability, a powerful cooldown that you will be able to use from time to time. 
From what I have seen in the past, the skins were tied to classes, but right now the game offers you more freedom in terms of how you want to look and what you want to play as. I was astonished when I discovered this class system because it offers so much depth and progression. So each class can be leveled up by playing it. While you level up, you will unlock new skill cards. With each escape or horde map completed, you will get new cards. The excessive cards of the same type can be used to upgrade the base version of the card so it will grant stronger boons. You can only equip a limited amount of the skill cards and their quality will vary. There are cards increasing weapon damage, lowering cooldowns, adding new effects to your headshots, melee attack. There is variety and this variety allows for effective build making. The same class can have different builds. You can go for an utility, support build or you can choose every card that increases your weapon damage for maximized damage output. It's a great system, I love it. Not only does it increase replayability, but also adds a totally new progression system. Let's pick a class and play some Horde. This mode focuses on setting up defenses and surviving consecutive waves of enemies. There are difficulty settings here and the harder the difficulty, the more affixes enemies will have. Affixes such as more damage dealt, switching to stealth mode when being closer than 10 meters to the player, dealing freezing damage. Some of those affixes are straightforward, some are creative. On master difficulty, there is this mandatory affix that when everyone in the team dies, the run is over. Without it, the team will respawn at the start of the wave they take. In horde mode, group of up to 5 players is going to fight against enemy forces that will get progressively stronger with each new wave. There are also boss fights occurring from time to time. An important thing that will add even more depth to this mode is the ability to upgrade the defensive machinery as we accumulate more and more currency for successfully surviving each wave and for killing opponents. In some cases, the gameplay here might even evolve into something akin of a tower defense game. And as a cherry on top, in Horde, you can also spend currency in between rounds on upgrading your own character. Each class will have access to different set of upgrades. There is just so much replay value in here. I loved Horde. The quantity of classes and maps combined with a lot of randomization in the affixes on various difficulties made it interesting for me. And on the harder difficulties, it's really cool how the whole team should bring their A game. There is a lot of nice synergies between classes and different builds that can be used in order to succeed. The design of this whole system is fantastic. The last thing to discuss about Horde in Gears 5 is its length. This is not a short match type of mode. Right now, every daily challenge Horde map is set to be played as Horde Frenzy, which is a mode that tasks players to complete 12 waves of enemies in order to succeed. It takes between 30 to 40 minutes usually. There of course is an option to play the old style Horde mode which is 50 waves long. From what I learned about the game, in the past it was a standard mode. I'm sorry but whoever designed it this way made a mistake. Expecting a group of players to stay in game for a prolonged period of time is unrealistic. 50 waves can take anything between 2 hours to 4 hours or maybe even more on harder difficulties. I read it in WoW from Vanilla till Warlords of Draenor. Hard and long content might be a really nice addition to your game, but mostly for organized groups. Random groups won't enjoy it. At the moment when even one person lives in the middle of an ongoing session, it creates problems for the rest of the group. So the decision to cut it to 12 waves, but make them a little bit more intense is a great decision. The escape mode also uses the class and card system. It makes use of the affixes on various difficulties, however there is no fortification building and no character upgrading. Escape is much shorter than Horde. It's designed for a groups of 3 players. Their main goal is to plant a bomb full of toxin in the middle of an enemy hive, which is happening in the introductory cutscene, and then running away from the heart of the swarm before the venom kills everything. So there is this pressure of pushing through enemies before toxin catches up to you. It's an interesting mode with a lot of map variety. I liked it, but Horde is my favorite. Good. The multiplayer offering of Gears 5 is great. So rich in content that I was amazed at the value given to the players. It's also really interesting to see how the multiplayer ranks and the daily challenges work right now. Years after release. Right now, developers cannot freely milk the limited player base this game has. So in order to make the progression more pleasant, each day we are given a new one day long experience boost. Which means that players effectively have a constant boost to their multiplayer experience. Ah, and it's a boost of 
400%. Yes, players gain 4 times the normal value of XP right now. Which begs for the question to be asked. If it's right now a new norm to keep XP gain at 4 times the base value in order to keep it fun and rewarding for players, shouldn't it be this way from the get-go? Because I can only imagine how slow and dreadful it would be to play without this boost. It just shows that nowadays progression and reward systems are designed to be grindy, but the moment the game loses popularity or starts bleeding players, it's quickly being reworked to make it fun instead of tedious. You have truly become... There's one thing that caught me by surprise. The amount of skins we are able to unlock or of course buy. At this moment, Gears 5 offers ability to play as any character that ever existed in this series. Well, if not every character, then at least a majority of them. Queen Mira, Dom, General Ram, Minth, Anthony Carmine, Benjamin Carmine, Clayton, Gary, any Carmine family member you can imagine. Then most of them can choose between couple of skins, they even have separate voice actors with their characteristic voice lines. I was not that invested in the series before, but if I would've been a hard and long time fan of this series, I'd be crazily fanboying over it. A cynical person can say, of course they added every character in order to sell them. Sure, you can look at it this way, but to be honest, it's not that much farming in order to obtain those skins through gameplay. We need to give them credit where credit is due. This is a respectable amount of care that this series deserves. Gears of War series is placed in a strong correlation with Unreal Engine. The first games were used as a showcase of how powerful this graphic engine was. Gears 5 uses the 4th edition of UE, so it's a given that the visuals are quite spectacular. Character models are very detailed, their faces and animations during cinematics look fantastic. The environments can look spectacular, the lush jungles of Hivebusters DLC can offer some great vistas. The same goes for the base game, especially when you add some impressive particle effects like dense fog or snowstorm. During second act, there is this place where Kaid and Del comment about temperatures going even lower than before. The screen turns more blue and most of the effects of wind and fog stops. It's the best in-game depiction of this atmospheric state when the temperatures get extremely low yet the air is so clear. I do not know how this occurrence is called in English, but the game sells this sensation really well. It's actually impressive. The open world sections allow developers to squish even more juices from Unreal Engine 4 than ever before. Unfortunately, there are some visual missteps. While the character faces look really good in cinematics, during gameplay sections they lack expressions and emotions. I know that most players won't even notice it, but I noticed how hollow those faces looked. Adding a little bit more animations would go a long way. It's especially noticeable during multiplayer, when MVPs are being shown. If a player won't choose any winning animation, then the character just stands there, and I swear, some of the faces look like they are constipated. I'm also going to take a jab at the visuals of third act. It's definitely an interesting idea with this desert full of red sand. It looks great, kinda outlandish. But when I approach some of the buildings in the other world, they seem like they were not shaded properly. They were too bright, which made them feel like separated from the environment. It just looked weird, however, I might be in the wrong here. But when you look at this, this is just bad visuals. The skybox, the way it connects with the ground level on the horizon line and that cheap sand gust effect. It looks like taken straight out of GTA Definitive Edition. Don't get me wrong, most of the game environments look impressive, but we have to point out the stinkers like this. Without criticism, there is less will to improve. This is impressive. This is not. The music and the sound design are set on a very high level. I liked the main theme for the game and its different iterations. The piece called Ice Overworld that plays during skiff sections in the second act is beautiful. I like how different it is from the other tracks because it helps to enhance distinction between the skiffing parts from more fighting focused heavier parts of the game. It's literally like a breath of fresh freezing air after hot dangerous sections. It might be a good time to mention that the composer responsible for the game's soundtrack is the acclaimed artist responsible for Game of Thrones and Westworld music. I'm sorry but I'm not going to try to say his full name because I'm afraid that I will butcher the pronunciation. The sound design in here is on point. 
the deformed sworn voices, weird screeches of sires and leeches, the howls of juvies that let you know when they are coming, it's all fantastic. Then there are the sounds of weapons which help you distinguish the firearms and also give them the extra oomph. When you hit the crucial reload just right and the sound of your weapon is magnified, it's a truly empowering feeling. Not only that, it's satisfying. Also I encourage you to play on headphones, because Gears 5 uses the Dolby Atmos sound which creates the illusion of a 3D sound landscape. It helps players with a spatial awareness which is invaluable in multiplayer. It also increases immersion. Voice acting in this game is very good. You cannot go wrong with Laura Bailey. Other characters are believable as well, but she's definitely the show stealer. If you are Batista fan then you have the option to play with him as Marcus. For me it was unimpressive. It does not mean that David did bad here, I just like the original better. Hey. Some of you might know a YouTuber called Cropcat. He makes a madly popular videos about games. The one called Gears 5 lags width and intensity shows an interesting what could have been if the coalition kept its focus on destructibility and nuances such as the titles made by Epic Games. After watching it I must admit that it's a shame that the coalition foregone the ways of the past, where so much of the environment could be destroyed. The game definitely has its sense of weight in character animations, there is also a very healthy dose of intensity in the gritty brutal finishers, but compared to Gears of War 3 you can clearly see that there is a lot of wasted potential here. I will link Cropcut video in the description. In terms of technical state I will say that the game works fine. I haven't got a single crash. There are some minor glitches but I haven't encountered any game breaking bugs and the ones that do occur are not very prevalent. In some areas the floor glitches in a weird way that obstructs movement a little bit. On some rare occasions I have seen enemies fly up a little bit before falling down into their spots. One time even my own character flew 10 meters up and then got back down. It was weird. While playing co with my wife, she got her screen locked in a zoomed camera position a couple of times. We had to reload the game to get rid of it. We also had a bug when one of the bosses was missing from a cutscene featuring it. Ah, and in escape mode after the starting cutscene, for some reason there is mouse on screen if you use keyboard and mouse and it takes the game about 3-4 seconds to start working properly. Before that happens, you cannot rotate your screen. As a game controller hater, I of course played Gears 5 on mouse and keyboard. It's a pleasant experience. I switched to controller only when I played cop so my wife can use keyboard. Let's talk about AI. First, the enemy AI. It's okay but could be better. As I said before the behavior of our enemies is varied based on their type. There are the ones that will try to push into player location and then there are the ones that will shoot from behind cover. It's a shame that they won't use any advanced tactics. And the ones that are charging players locations, such as grenaders and scions, are doing it by slowly approaching player instead of at least using some of the coverage. The enemy AI is definitely abusable. Gotcha. What about the AI of our companions? I feel like it's worse than the enemy AI. Or maybe it feels worse because you spend more time closer to your followers than the enemies. Jack actually works fine, he executes the orders given to him quite well. You just need to remember that he needs to move to a certain position, so usually there is a lag of 1 or 2 seconds before he will do what you ordered him to do. I think that the game could benefit from some system of pinging your suggestions to AI allies. You know, hold position, go there. Right now it's only focus fire on certain enemy. Dell and in some cases other companions will follow you mindlessly wherever you go. It can lead to some cases when they will block your way when you want to quickly turn back. At least they give up their cover for you. Ah, and on some occasions Dell or Lani in High Pastors DLC went out so far into the enemy light that I knew if they fall there I won't be able to revive them. It's sometimes frustrating. Talking about frustrations, there was this quite tough fight in the base game with big chunks of ice falling down. The place where the big ice formations would drop was signaled with small icicles raining down in that place for a short amount of time before the big one came down. So after a couple of tries I finally have beaten this stage but before I could get to checkpoint I watched as Dal controlled by AI slowly walked into icicle rain only to be crushed by the big ice chunk. The game forced me to replay the whole section after that. Into the cave! Hurry!
Talking about checkpoints leads me to another observation. Gears 5 does not let its players save game as they wish. It uses a checkpoint based save system. I always like this solution in shooter games because it forces you to complete the whole combat section instead of scam saving your way through it. So I commend that design choice. Of course given that after completing the fight your companion won't get torn to pieces in some stupid way. Hive Busters is the only paid DLC released for this game. It offers a campaign that will take around 3 to 5 hours to complete depending on your pace and difficulty settings. The story focuses on a team of 3 unlikely allies that have to work together on a secret mission. Right from the start we can notice that the tone here is much lighter compared to the base game. It's also more action focused, more dynamic, even the music theme contains guitar riffs characteristic to more action oriented pieces of media. I even got some Wolfenstein New Order vibes. Since the whole adventure does not take that long to complete, the plot is very condensed. Because of that I felt like the quality of the writing suffers. It's very cliché. Team of unlikely heroes gets together. They disagree with each other but they overcome their differences, share some emotional stories about their past and overcome the challenge. The last mission is a clear example of this. Each character waits for their turn to talk about their past. The other two characters comfort and compliment the one sharing and then start telling their story. This DLC definitely could benefit from one more chapter just to stretch the plot a little bit. The new areas we are going to explore are beautiful. It's mostly going to be a dense jungle setting with picturesque views. This time there is no open overworld exploration, just a linear path to your goal and I think it's fun. In terms of gameplay Hivebusters offers more of the same, just a different setting. There is this addition of an active ultimate ability for each one of the main characters. Playing with those cooldowns introduces a new dynamic into the series where you can safely snipe enemies staying behind Max shield. You can order Lani to use her electroblade where there are dangerous enemies nearby to just get rid of them. Of course if you play as Lani you can do it yourself. Ammunition is not a problem here thanks to Keegan's restock ability. Those abilities can be strengthened by funding upgrades in various chapters. If you are efficient with the usage of character abilities then Hivebusters is a little bit easier than the base game, even on inconceivable difficulty. The campaign can of course be played in co-op mode by up to 3 players. This DLC does not offer any new endings. There is one new boss fight but if you played a lot of Horde before then you probably already fought it. The class system in campaign is something kinda new but you have access to those classes in Horde so they are hardly anything unique at this point. What all of that means is that by buying Hivebusters DLC you are pretty much paying for a new campaign and that's all. I do not have a problem with that, it's just something people should be aware of. Ok, let's get to the part where I will check the latest 200 Steam reviews in order to see what kind of criticism people leave it at this game. It can be an interesting source of information of what community liked and what made them angry. As always, I do not consider my opinion as superior, I just want to compare my point of view with other people's opinions. At the time of making this video, Gears 5 sits at a score of 69% of positive reviews out of more than 50,000 user reviews. Right away we can see that for a title of this magnitude, a continuation of such a renowned series, 15,000 is not a lot. For example, Far Cry 5 has more than 100,000 user reviews. Of course, it might be this way because most of the player base access the game through Game Pass, not Steam. Let's talk about some general observations, then I will check some positive opinions and then I will try to see what are the main problems people had with this title. The first thing to talk about here is story. It's so divisive. I feel like there is the same amount of people that praise it and the same that dislike it. Writer's choice to explain some of the lore elements got ridiculed, especially by a long time fans of the series. I predicted that this might be the case. I do not have any problems with the way lore is explored and expanded, it's acceptable but I understand why so many people might dislike it. Sorry for being brief, no spoilers. The cast of young characters is also divisive. Again a lot of long time fans of the series did not like Marcus being exchanged for JD and Kate. Visuals and co-op are definitely praised. People like the multiplayer but there is a lot of criticism about the lack of online players. What else did majority of people like? Horde mode gets a lot of praise. I deeply agree with this sentiment. Steam users seem to like Escape as a multiplayer mode but in many reviews it stated that it gets repetitive much faster than Horde, which I also agree. 
Okay, let's get to negative opinions. This one is much more interesting to me because Steam reviews tend to be more specific when it comes to the actual things people dislike. First thing, Kate. I will just throw a reminder in here. I have only played the first Gears of War before. I am not strongly attached to the previous characters. There is a lot of criticism about Kate being unlikable, whiny, and that the coalition pushes the latest politically correct trends in their game. I don't want to get political in here, I will just say that I am against forced diversity for the sake of it. At the same time, I do not feel that in here it is forced or it does not have any sense in the story arc. I can't say what are the developers intentions, but as I said in the story section, given that we play as young characters that had some traumatic events happening already in their life, it's understandable that there might be some problems with their behavior. You can disagree with the whole decision to make us play as this new generation of younger, inexperienced individuals. But as this decision was already made, the writing of their motivation and character traits is pretty believable, in my opinion. Would it be cool to still play as Marcus? It would be awesome, but as I am not that attached to him, I am completely okay with playing as Kate. I want to say that I can understand people being disgruntled by this decision, especially long-time fans. If I would have been more invested into the series, I maybe would have different sentiments about this whole thing. The one observation that is definitely true, the game lost its heavy, depressing at times atmosphere for something much lighter. This review focuses mainly on the lack of ability to play split-screen Horde and other modes. From what information I gathered, it was viable in previous titles, so criticism for taking it away is surely understandable. There is definitely a big problem with some of the Logitech hardware where speakers do not work properly with the game sound. People are describing a lot of muffled, very silent voices, as well as problem with 3D sounds. Take that into consideration if you are using Logitech products. I do not mean that Logitech has a bad products by the way, this is probably more of the game's fault, just be aware that there is this occurrence. So, in general, the biggest tensions about this title comes from the change of main cast of characters. Some people also notice that the gameplay got stale, some people even describe it as boring. Then there are some negative reviews talking about bugs and glitches, the lower number of players is also being noticed. Of course, there are reviews talking about a dead game. A sentiment that I do not agree with, albeit the numbers truly are low. Disclaimer: I do not want to berate any of the opinions or users showed here. Everyone is entitled to their opinions. I can be wrong, they can be wrong. We all have some ground to stand on. This is the beauty of having an argument about something we all care for. This is the achievement section. I have this goal whenever I play a game to get at least 75% achievement completion. If I like the particular title or trophies are quite easy to get or grinding them is fun, I'll go for more than 75%, maybe I'll even try to max out the game. I always enjoyed completing this kind of checklist in my adventures, because that's pretty much what achievements are, a checklist. However, I understand that many people do not care about it, so feel free to skip this part. If you want to go for 100% completion, you need to own Hivebusters DLC. But more importantly, you need time and dedication. Because this game, this friggin game, has some of the most grindy achievements I encountered. I played World of Warcraft for almost 12 years and that game, when it comes to achievements, is in a league of its own. But here the grindiest challenges can be easily compared to one of the more time-consuming WoW trophies. What am I talking about? Well, let's see. How about an achievement for dealing 400 million damage in Horde or Escape modes? 400 millions! There are some of those achievements that I guess are designed to be obtainable only by the most hardcore, die-hard fans of this game. Another example, get 50,000 assists in Versus, kill 100,000 enemies in Versus or a crowning one. Seriously, 5.0 Chapter 2. It has so many requirements that it's crazy. Some of them are time consuming, but some of them require an amazing skill in order to be obtained. Mastering all Horde and Escape maps is a tough task to complete. You might think that I disagree with this kind of achievement design. Actually, I don't. I can appreciate a team of developers that want to give a chance for their most devoted fans to prove themselves within the community. I just think that maybe the required numbers in here might be a little bit inflated. Of course, there are already a lot of ways that Gears Completionist found out to cheese some of those achievements. Where there's a will, there's a way. 
So, let's talk about more standard kind of achievements. First of all, there are story progression ones. Those are awarded both in main campaign and in Hulkbusters DLC. There are also trophies available to grab for completing the whole story on inconceivable difficulty. In both campaigns there are collectibles. They are tied to uncovering some plot nuances. Of course there are achievements available for finding all of them. One for main story, one for DLC. There is cool collectibles menu that will let players know where they might have missed something. Fully upgrading your team in Hivebusters is also rewarded. The same thing is true for Jack, so keep looking for those components. You can try to hunt for the ones you missed in New Game Plus. When it comes to Jack there are trophies tied to its abilities. For example an achievement for making him fetch every kind of heavy weapon. Catching 6 enemies in one shock trap or killing 3 targets during one stealth fuse. I wouldn't count them as hard to get, you just need to be aware of them and the opportunity for completion will show up. One of the patches also introduced trophies related to New Game Plus. There is a trophy for finishing a whole act with Batista Marcus, there is a reward for playing with custom skins for your weapons and characters. New Game Plus gives you this option. Gears 5 offers a lot of multiplayer achievements. This might cause problems to some people that do not like to play multiplayer modes. There are some specific challenges like, for example, getting killed in arcade blitz mode, then changing loadout to different character and then executing a revenge upon your murderer. Some of them might feel like it will take ages to execute those requirements in public multiplayer matches. There is a cheese way here. Create and host your own match. Block ability for anyone to join. Fill it with bots. Then complete any requirements you have to complete. It's easy and quite fast. If you want then you can of course do it the right way in public matches. So there are ways to bypass some of the multiplayer requirements, but let's be real, a lot of the achievements will require help of other players. And here's my call to action. I said that I am aiming for at least 75% total achievement completion. I still haven't got there. That's why I am setting up my Discord server. The link will be in the description. If you are watching this video a month, two, three, maybe even four months after its release, chances are that I still might be playing Gears 5 multiplayer from time to time. If you wish to join then hop on Discord. Bear in mind that I am still setting it up and I have zero experience with operating it, so it's really really raw at the moment. Ah, and another disclaimer, my gaming hours are very irregular because I run my own business, so it might be hard to catch me. If there will be enough people willing to try Gears 5 together, then we will just schedule something up. Before playing Gears 5 you should ask yourself one question. Do you enjoy its cover shooter gameplay loop? If the answer is positive, then the game offers its players a massive amount of content. A single player campaign that can be played in co-op even on split screen. There are many interesting multiplayer modes. Horde and Escape offer an additional progression system which just adds depth and replayability. It's true that the player numbers are low. Keep that in mind, you can still reliably find matches. Especially in the evenings or during weekends. The campaign and the story are decent, although they have some weak moments. If you are a long time Gears of War fan, you might not agree with the direction this series is taking. The Hivebusters DLC adds a new campaign. It's more action oriented and offers a class based characters with some ultimate abilities. It can create some nice tactical options during the playthrough. Unfortunately, the campaign is quite short. Whether you are a newcomer to the series or a long time fan, the main thing is that the gameplay loop of Gears 5, while solid, is pretty much the same since the first game, so it might get stale for some people. It wasn't for me. I recommend this game. Hey, I want to thank every one of you for watching this video. If you liked it then consider subscribing for more content and leave a like. If you didn't like it feel free to press thumbs down and let me know what you didn't like. There is also a link to my discord in the description below the video, feel free to join.
My question to you after this video is, what is your relationship with Gears of War series? Do you think that with Gears 5 they choose the right direction for the franchise? I'm especially interested in opinions of long-time Gears fans, but everyone is welcome to chime in. So, that's all from me. Bye.